Hello everyone, uh, Jack here, welcome to Curb TV. Uh, we've got another Curb workshop today. Um, so we're gonna be talking about pitch decks all day, what they are, why they're useful, and how to perfect them so you can use them to get to the next uh, stage of your business. Uh, obviously before all of that, remember that you can support all of our traders at curbfood.store, which is just here. Um, and we also have a Curb Bootcamp today with a new trader who's on the up. Um, so stay in, stay tuned to see them and a special guest as well in the form of Joel from Oh My Dog. Uh, before all of that, um, we're running a competition at the moment, one of our lockdown lunches. We've got kind of a delivery focus all week and uh, you can win a truffle burger kit if you subscribe to the Curb TV channel uh, on YouTube and must be following both Curb Food and Truffle London on the screen. Don't worry about the date, there's still time to enter the competition. So before uh, before we talk with our bootcamp star today, uh, I'm going to introduce my co-host Ollie. Hi, Ollie. Oh, hi. Hello. How How's you it doing? going? Pretty good. Good. Got Enjoying the sun. Yeah, and I've got some reasonably exciting news. I might be getting a dog today. Oh, which nice. has been on, it's been on the cards for quite a while, so I'm very excited. Yeah, you're going to be a dog daddy. A dog daddy. I've got the dad mod. Okay, perfect. You're like 80% there then. So. I'm going to be a dog dad. Cool. And is there a name for the dog? Yes. Uh, we're going to call him Slug. Slug. Slug the dog. Slug the dog, yeah. Great. Can't wait to meet him. Um, it's a, it's a uh, controversial name, I get. I get that. Yeah. Um, so you're going to be talking today about pitch decks. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know what a pitch deck is, what, what is it and why is it important? So um, you ba it's basically a way of selling yourself to someone who has to make a decision about your business. Um, they're, they're called pitch decks, they're called proposals, they're called brochures, loads of different things. Essentially, it's a nice designed package which talks about your business and tells the person who's making a decision I'm decent at this. Take a chance on me, um, yeah. because uh, you'll you won't regret it. Yeah, and it's a way of showing that you're kind of serious. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're going to talk you through the different things that you kind of need to include in it, and we can talk to the different like levels of detail you need to go into based on um, how long you've been going as a business or kind of what you're asking for. Yeah. So should we get started? Let's do it. Okay, so first things first, let's go through the contents of what we're going to be talking about today. First thing, we're going to talk about what you're trying to convey with your pitch deck, what you're trying to say, what you're trying to ask for, that kind of stuff. And then we're going to talk through all the different things that we sh you should put in it. And then we're going to talk through, uh, we're going to use an example of designing one, basically. We're going to do one live on air. Awesome. Um, which will be in. So this is my first uh, bit of advice. You essentially, when you're uh, putting out a pitch deck, you're kind of competing with people at the same level as you. So if you're trying to get onto a market, you're competing with other new uh, street food businesses. If you're trying to get your first restaurant, you're competing with other um, people who are trying to get their first restaurant. So they'll be at different levels of like capability of their business. So like I've done this graph here, which is totally made up. I'm no, I like, I'd be, it'd be wicked if you could get a board within five years and all that kind of stuff. But in the first year, people kind of really just want to hear about your idea because that's all that, that's all you've really got at the time. And so if you can package that up in a, in an interesting way, then that's better than going like, yeah, I've got a whole massive team. I've got an operations director. I've got a finance director. I've done my research. I've commissioned a study that says these are the perfect areas for me to launch my business in. Like, you have no idea what's going to happen to your business after the first year. So don't worry about putting any of that stuff in because for, it, it'll probably put people off because it makes you seem like you haven't actually done the research. You've yeah. looked up how to run a business and then put in all the information that you've read on the internet, but not actually gone out and seen what other people in the same industry are doing. Yeah, it's like tailoring your CV for uh, a job application, right? 
like yeah. it's that, those little extra bits of detail is what stands out to people. Yeah. So if you think about, say it is getting your first pitch and you're competing with other street food traders, what can you do that shows that you're ahead of them? And this is what we'll come on to now. So your brand is obviously the like the main thing you're going to be showing because you can't send a pizza through. You can send a pizza through the through the mail actually. Pizza pilgrims do that, but that's not the point. You can't send. You can't give people a a, a taste of your food through a PDF. So the way that they'll understand about your business is by using the brand. This is uh, the first slide of a pitch deck that was designed for only Jerkin. And like, it's so easy to work out like how it would look because only Jerkin have a clear color scheme. They've already got their logo. Interestingly, actually, the, well, the first draft of this, only Jerkin's uh, logo was slightly tilted, but Jess and Luke complained because they're like, the J has to be vertical. So they have brand guidelines, essentially. And then they've got their typeface and they've got other design elements like the the orange drops and stuff like that. So obviously you want your brand running throughout. Sorry. Yes. That's okay. And this this is where if you have a graphic if you've worked with a, a graphic designer or a friend who designed your logo, this is where having a fantastic graphic designer to work with is really helpful because graphic designers really understand the, how important this communicating this stuff. So if you can design all of this first uh, just in terms of like the content and maybe what you want to say and then you can use someone else's expertise to make this really pop exactly yeah so next get photos of your food and get nice photos of your food um here is uh two pictures of one of our traders chop shop they do cambodian noodles uh the one on the left is a professional photographer really nice photo the one on the right i took when i had it at a market like a, a few months ago and like it's fine but the one on the left says so much it's so much nicer it's like improperly in focus it's not got someone's big fat thumb in it um it's probably <laughs> it's got the nice branding and the colors of the, behind so yeah. get someone who can take nice photos of your food to take a bank of photos that you can use for this or just find what if, if you've already started trading just find the best ones off the internet message the person who took it and be like do you mind if i use your picture and they'll be like no yeah. of course not it's great i, I love it, support it's really it's really easy way to like champion and celebrate your food mm. and i remember when we kind of opened up a lot of our older photos to our traders and uh for free and they started using them on their instagram and things like that and it just gave them that extra level of like content and professionalism to help them stand out exactly yeah yeah and uh when you're competing with other people, are they going to have these good photos? Maybe not. That's another way you stand out. So next, a photo of your stool. Obviously, if you're pitching for a market and you haven't done one yet, it's very hard to have a picture of you at a market. It's like well, it's impossible because you haven't done it yet. So um, you can do a, you can put it up in your garden. You can do a mock up. So this is actually a picture of Carly's stool. So she's done a mock up of what it would look like, and then. If, I, if I'm making a decision about what trader to have at a market, I can be like, oh, I know what it'll look like. Perfect. I know that they've put some thought into the design, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So definitely take a picture of what your setup looks like. In the same way that if you were pitching for another restaurant, you would take a picture of what the original restaurant is. You're essentially just showing the work you've done. And then we'll come on to this, but you're like, give me a chance and I'll improve it. The next, so here's a little test for you, Jack. Mm -hmm. What are these two businesses? The, these are uh, I've taken this off two people's websites, and you've got to tell me what uh, businesses both of them are. They're essentially their elevator pitch. So it's something that you can say in a paragraph or two, like why you're different, what about your story is interesting. Yeah. And uh, uh, so the the first one's Tucker. Yeah, correct. Uh, and the second one is Nazari. Spot on. Very good. Yeah. But is it like it's interesting that you can you can get that without even having the name because they kind of, you know, well, I mean, the Tucker one's obvious because it just says where they're trading. 
and yeah. that they're Australian. But the the second one, it shows that they they kept that brand throughout everything they're doing, and they they come back to that as their like elevator pitch yeah. or lift pitch if you're English. Um, <laughs> so after that, stick in your your story. So um, different to the elevator pitch, this is basically a chronicle of where you've come from. So this is uh, from Cheese Bar's uh, crowdfunding proposal. And this was essentially just, we started here, we did this, we've done this, we did a, uh, we opened a site, we've done that. Like just yeah. tell people like the story of your business and then people can understand that you've constantly sort of progressed You've added new things. You've tried new things. You work yeah. with good suppliers, yeah. that kind of stuff. And it, it 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 makes you so much more interesting as well. You know, it makes people buy in to you that much more. Like when we talked about the hero dish last week. You know, it's about like in this context, Matt is a is a hero. Like starting from nothing and selling twenty um, cheese, like grilled cheese toasties, on a market to where he is today. That's such a good thing. That, uh, for a good story to tell them and people are, want to hear that want to hear the success especially if you're asking for money as well like they want to hear that you've you've had this like rags to riches story where you only sold 20 sandwiches and now you're uh, one of the top traders in London's greatest food hall there you go very good um, so put your story in there this is I, I don't know if like this is an obvious or something, but just put what you're selling. Tell people the actual dishes you're selling and the ingredients that go into it. Like, the, like if you were sat down at a restaurant and a waiter came up and handed you something, put that in the slides so people can get a sense that you're not just the food that the pictures show, you might have other stuff as well. Like if you look at this menu that Zephyr put on, did you know Zephyr wanted to do a chicken club? Did you know they do virgin halloumi? Or would you have just looked at their Instagram and seen that they just do burgers? Yeah. So definitely include the sort of expanded business uh, menu because, like, there's so much more information that can – this might swing someone who originally wasn't sure. Definitely. Keep including information, but obviously make it look nice. Um, press. Obviously, if, if – uh, Marina O'Loughlin or Jay Rayner has written about you and said the food's good. It's a good sign that the food is good. But you can, you, 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 if you're not going to get those like top end critics talking about you, you can still use people who've taken a picture of your food on the internet and written about it. It's kind of like just getting uh, another person's viewpoint on something because like you're obviously going to be partisan about your own business, but having someone else be like, what a perfect day for barbecue dreams. Our, our first try and find the food and we absolutely loved it. There we go. Well, that's at least one person saying it. And even if you know them, yeah. the person you're pitching to doesn't know that. So, um, yeah, if you're just starting out, it's hard to do this, obviously. But um, I would include it once you start getting that bit of press or acknowledgements. Yeah. It, it just gives you that level of authority and uh, difference to other people, especially if you're doing something that lots of other people are doing, like a cheese toastie or a burger or things like that. Yeah. Like imagine if you're listed on like London's top 10 burgers, someone's going to be like, oh, great. They're one of the best burgers in London. So I'm more than happy to have them at my market. Uh, I would do this if you actually if it actually makes sense for you to do it. So this is from Smoke and Bones is one. Uh, personally, I don't like it when people are like, "I'm the CEO of this street food company," because there's like one of you. It doesn't make sense. So you can like founders fine. You can put founder, but um, it's quite nice. So. Uh, Bad Boy Pizza Society that we've got coming up later, we've got four people profiling each of one, each one of them and saying like what their skills are or what they like is, is great because it shows a bit of personality about the business. But until yeah. you're at that stage where you actually need to show that you have a legitimate team around you, you probably don't need to put it in. 
to answer. Um, so obviously, <laughs> you need to now say what you want. So you need to say like, I want to be at Curb Markets because I think I'd add a great uh, addition to the lunchtime offers. I would love to do this type of marketing with it. And you kind of like painting a picture of like the dream scenario of the future. Doesn't necessarily mean that you actually have to hit all of that because you can say like, oh, this thing happened and, and I couldn't manage it or I was too busy to do that. But you're showing someone that you've got loads of ideas. And if you're going into a restaurant, you can say like, we're going to do a big PR campaign to launch. We're going to do uh, discounts on something on, on a day. I don't know. Just cut, you come up with ideas and it, put it in there. It shows intent, basically. It shows yeah. like it shows someone what you'd like to do, what you're, what, you know, even if you don't kind of pull all those things off, it's like what you want to do, where you want to go. Exactly. And if you're the best situation you can be in is if the person that you're pitching to feels that they're going to miss out on the opportunity of you being of you of them working with you they'll be like oh i could have you know worked with this company when it was little and now it's massive and they would have been a great story to say or an investor might be like well that's a massive opportunity so try and inspire fomo with with this idea bit and obviously include contact details i mean it's pretty obvious to say that but i don't know if everyone does because they assume just because you've emailed it to someone uh they'll have your email address and their contact details but you don't know who that person's going to pass it on to like you yeah. might email it to me i might not be making a decision i might pass it on to someone and they're like well how do i contact them oh, i can't be bothered and and having legit emails as well like yes. like this email in your example it gives such a an kind of aura of professionalism and seriousness but if it was just you know angus101 at gmail.com it's like oh is this person actually serious about what they're doing it doesn't it doesn't scream to me like professional organization i want to work with exactly so we're now on to designing your pitch deck um and actually henry We'd like to invite you to see this because. Hi, so this, hi. So, hi Henry. Let's, uh, Jack. Do you want to just explain what's coming yeah. up on the boot camp? So, so um, yeah, Henry's going to be doing our boot camp layer. So we're going to be talking about their their street his street food business with three of his friends, Bad Boy Pizza Society, who came who won tickets to one of our workshops in October last year. Yeah. And you had yeah. a fun day, right? Right. Yeah. Learned a lot already to go. Um, and so we we kind of approached it today in the sense of like, well, how would you design a pitch deck? What would you include in it? So, uh, Ollie, after you. So I didn't even take, I, like, if you got a proper designer to do this, it would be much better, obviously. But I spent a few, like, last night just designing a sort of a, an example pitch deck for Bad Boy Pizza Society, okay? So here's the logo. That's Obviously it. Obviously using the GTA logo, the GTA uh, font for the logo. Uh, so that's a good start. Then you have a nice picture of a pizza. Like that. Got the artistic blur. And then in... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then here's a here's like a description of the Bad Boy Pizza Society, what you do, a picture of you. Was that in where was that? Rome or that Naples? Was in Naples a couple of years ago. Yeah. Now. yeah. So you're explaining what you do, like the food you serve, all that kind of stuff, how it got started. Mm hmm Picture of two of your guys. Yes. Saying that you do delivery using unis. You're in Teddington and Southampton. Once life resumed, I took this all off your website, by the way, so I didn't write any of the copy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then a bit, a bit, yeah, it's a bit of uh, your menu. I think <laughs> Ollie's internet might have just gone in and out. Uh, but yeah, so you can see like a lot of this stuff is, was already there, like on your website. It was quite easy just to put together into context. Mm -hmm. Am I back? Yes, you can are. Can you hear back. me again? 
Okay, yeah. So this was all stuff uh, people had said on Instagram about you. Oh, nice. So any of them actually just friends? A couple of them. We've got a few randos <laughs> in there, though. <laughs> so do that. And then I was, I was thinking maybe you want to get a pizza so you can focus on the one that says, do you guys have a shop now? And then the idea of you focusing on the first pizza restaurant slash travel agent the world has ever seen, looking at sites in Southampton and Southwest London. Future tours include New York, LA, Singapore, Copenhagen. Copenhagen. And then I said, why run a pizza restaurant when you can run a pizza society? Boom. And some pictures of Rome. And then your contact details. Nice little heart-shaped pizza. <laughs> And that's it. Yeah, solid. Good work. So I, if, if that got, yeah, you hired. If that got <laughs> sent to us, we'd be like, "Wow, this, these people know what they're doing." But um, now obviously, not everyone does that. So uh, you can have this now. You can send that out to other market people. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, we'll invoice you another time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, awesome. So, so yeah, after you. Uh, it's the boot camp now. Let's do the boot camp intro. Okay, so we're we've, we're halfway through now. So um, got your own pitch deck, pitch deck designed for you, Henry. How's that feel? It feels great. Yeah. It's Not it's, it, yeah, and obviously it's helpful that you've documented like so much of your journey uh, from where you started. Like, um, just for anyone who's watching, can you tell us a bit more about Bad Boy Pizza Society and kind of what led you to to starting it? So yeah, we're just boys from Southampton Uni, and one day we were offering a free pizza if you go beer. So four of us went down, got the free pizza, and decided to set up an Instagram there and then. Started going around reviewing pizzas. So that's how it all really started. Okay. And when, when when was this? Back in 2018. Okay, cool. So for the first year we were just going around reviewing pizzerias and then it's just organically kind of become this and now we're taking a stab at going into london yeah so i mean what how, why did you sell on the bad boy like what makes you bad boys or what makes a bad boy <laughs> in this context well it, it can't really be good boy pizza society it's just <laughs> not the ring to it and I guess we're just not trying to appeal to everyone we're quite outlandish in our captions and that. Yeah. And yeah, we just made the Instagram at the very beginning and we just haven't changed it. So it's, um, and I guess that that's one of the things when you're choosing to do a, pro a product that like everyone knows pizza, everyone eats pizza, you know, even there obviously there are successful brands now like Franco Manca and Pizza Pilgrim mm -hmm. who've started in kind of street food worlds and are now on like well were on every high street like in London south south yeah. of England and etc so um it's good that you're thinking like what how do we stand out against that and by by using like the society um to stand out kind of people are buying into a different kind of experience than just good pizza but like good pizza can you can find almost anywhere now right yeah 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 for sure um uh, yeah, but, just trying to stand out with our story i guess yeah so so when you started the society you started it as a university society is that right yeah 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 so we've okay, been what? on tours to naples and rome now it's only what, really what, in the past few months that we tried to transition into a street food business. Okay. The well, workshop. I, yeah. And uh, when you, so you came to a workshop in October, you actually won some tickets to it. 
Um, so what what was it about street food that made you think like, oh, this is the best, this might be the most accessible way for us to, to go wherever we want to go? Slightly just the low risk. Like it's not a restaurant where you're going to have to pump in loads of money. You can yeah. kind of do it with not a lot of money. So we're all keeping side jobs as well at the moment. And the fact that we can start part time is just great. Yeah. And hopefully take off and we make it full time in the near future. Yeah. That's and so so at the moment you there's four of you, right? And two of you are in London and two of you are in Southampton. Yeah, so the boys yeah. in Southampton are just finishing uni and they recent last week have just set up their own delivery service on top of the one here in London. Okay, cool. And in a few months we'll join together. Okay. So that's quite that's quite cool to like be doing the same thing in like two different places. What what's how have they been different or how have they been similar? Um they're similar in the same dough recipe. So we try and keep it the same, but we have really different menus. Lockdown, obviously no one's doing much, so complete creative freedom on the menu. Yeah. Is something I personally enjoy. It's, I don't want to have them. They don't want to have to do the same as me. So yeah, we're just doing that completely different, yeah. and that's part of the fun. And what, what's it? What's it been like becoming a delivery driver? Well, I've only actually done about five deliveries myself. It's my brother who oh, okay. is doing every single delivery for me. My dad has happily stepped in a couple of times, which is great. Um, but yeah, no, I am single-handedly making all of the pizzas here in Teddington. And yeah, I think. So yeah, unpaid labour is always a really helpful way. <laughs> unpaid family labour to get ahead. Um, so like, obviously, you know, with the current situation, you kind of maybe stopped from doing whatever was next, but you've managed to kind of pivot um, to doing deliveries, which pizza delivery, that kind of makes sense um yeah. what what so why is it that you're kind of um struggling with or or kind of looking to do next like what 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 are you itching to do well we're, number wise we're at the limit really here in teddington so yeah. if there's a way to expand and that would probably be a logical step but we're kind of comfortable it's a small thing we're now hitting 50 orders on friday saturday and okay. we, for the for the meantime it kind of is what it is yeah take it further we just want to get back to the curb markets and festivals and stuff really yeah yeah because obviously like it's this this time of year is for any street food traders peak season but we know like pizza traders who are curb traders like wonder crust uh, often do like they like it's that summer season that that really really helps them like doing festivals doing like hundreds of pizzas an hour um, and so that's a good segue into our guest uh, for today um, who has lots of experience um, doing high fest high high turnover kind of events and festivals and hitting the high numbers um, mm -hmm. so I'm going to bring in him on now uh, and it's Joel from Oh My Dog so. Hi, Joel. How are you? Hey guys. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. How you doing? Good. I like the plant in the background. Oh, thank you. Yeah, just, uh, you yeah. know, make it look a bit nicer for the video call. Yeah, so, it looks hey, great. You all right? Yeah, I'm oh, great, thank you. Uh, so, um, yeah, so we have Henry from Bad Boy Pizza Society. I imagine you heard some of what we were talking about, but basically they started as a uh, university society in Southampton, and mm -hmm. then they're looking to start becoming a street food trader when things kind of start going back to normal. And uh, they came to a workshop and they've started doing deliveries in Southampton and London. And yeah, I, I, asked, I asked Henry to like come up with a couple of questions about like where to go from, from here, like how to take that next step. So uh, yeah, Joel, um, Henry, do you have any questions for Joel? So, Joe, I don't know how much you've 
ventured into the delivery market yourself. Mm-hmm. But I'm wondering, is there an online system that, well, currently with all my deliveries, I'm writing them all down on a bit of paper. It's all very in my head. I'm having to be on my phone constantly taking orders. Mm-hmm. So if there's an online system that takes into account like the journey time, the order size and everything. Yeah. Please, please tell me. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, I'm, I won't confess to like being an absolute expert on deliveries myself. Uh, we, we do deliveries, mainly through Deliveroo uh, when we're open. Um, but it's something I've looked into a lot. And um, there are apps that, that do what you want it to do. Um, there's one called AppAway, which uh, will basically, you can create your own like ordering app for it. Uh, my friends who run a breakfast delivery company, uh, they used to use that when they were doing home deliveries. And they said out of all the different ones they looked at, they thought that was best for them because um, I think it's, it's quite affordable and it's a flat rate. So I think a lot of the these types of apps will charge you a percentage on each order, which might not be that much of a big deal if you're doing the deliveries yourself. But if you're looking to use third-party delivery people at some point, you know they charge a lot. So having another you know three four five six percent on top of that just for your kind of ordering platform um might not make sense but the other options are you've got one called order swift um pizza pilgrims use those guys i know only jerkin have started using them recently as well and they seem like quite an established one Um, but they do as far as i know they do charge a percentage but that could be a bit out of date um there's another one called live pepper as well which uh yard sale and uh fire as use so i say like look into those three so appleway order swift and live pepper and maybe appleway is a good one to kind of start off with because like i say it's just a flat rate uh each week rather than a percentage of your orders but yeah. do research see, see what works so nice um so I, one of the other things i guess is um like Henry and like all of your your friends who started Bad Boy Pizza Society, you're kind of you're doing other jobs at the moment. Two people are still at uni. So Joel, like what what was the point for you where you started kind of shifting away from doing it part time to full time? And what what do you think helps people like make that transition? Mm, it's a really good question. So I'm probably not the best example of this because I got a lot of things wrong. Um, but hopefully you can learn from from my mistakes. Perfect, perfect. This is what we want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the, the kind of the turning point for me was I felt that I couldn't, that, that basically my day job was getting in the way of what I was trying to do with Oh My Dog. Um, but then uh, looking back on it, like I had no working capital whatsoever. So like, I had no like reserve of cash to pay myself um, if it didn't take off straight away. Um, I also, you know, I didn't have enough work lined up at all. You know, I thought I did, but looking back on it, you know, I didn't have anywhere near enough work to support just myself as one founder. So having four founders, you know, every every pound you make, that's, you know, 25p to you, 25p to them, you know, so it's, it's gonna be difficult. Um, but yeah, you know, like um, I, what I did was I, I moved back in with my parents, which meant I was saving money on rent. And that, that really helped. Um, and because I kind of just went all in and just went, right, yeah, I'm leaving my job and we're doing this like full on. Even though I didn't really have enough, I, had, I wasn't prepared enough. Um, I think just that fact that I'd chucked in my job and this was real now meant I had to push myself even harder. So, you know, there are, there are various different, like there, there's probably like no perfect time to do it, but I feel like there's definitely a few steps you can do beforehand just to make it a bit easier than, than kind of how it was for me. So, you know, I speak to some other traders and, you know, so, some of those guys made sure they had six months rent um, before they before they quit their job. I mean, I think that's a great idea if you're able to do that. Um, I wasn't. Um, you can get startup loans as well um but you know i think um realistically it, it all depends on your circumstances yeah uh, say like 
work out how much money you, you need at the absolute minimum to survive on and then like take 25% off that and then work out if you can survive on that and then just, just go for it. But before you go for it, make sure you've got your branding tight, which is one thing I did do right, I think. Make sure you've got your products nailed. You know, you've got your hero dish or dishes. You know, get some practice in as well. Um, like go out, like, I mean, obviously you've, you've done like parties and stuff, which is what we did as well. The one thing I didn't do was like go and work for other traders and like, you know, get experience that way. And looking back on it, that would have been really helpful. Yeah. Um, so I'd say like the key things are like, sort your brand it out, get your product nailed, get some practice in so you know what you're doing. Have work lined up so that you know you can basically, you know, support what, what you need to, well, you've got enough business to support yourself. And then, um, yeah, try and get like your GP nailed early on, get your supply chain as optimized as possible. Don't waste loads of time driving around, picking things up, get everything delivered. Once you've got those kind of things nailed, then you can probably be in a bit more of a comfortable position to say, do you know what? It feels like this is the right time to quit my day job. So let, and I've got these steps in place, so let's just go for it. Whereas what I did was kind of went, well, you know, it feels like the right time, so let's just do it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I think I think for some people, like we talk about it a lot on these workshops, like everyone has a different circumstances. And I know it's like cliche, but you just have to figure out like what is best for you. And like, obviously for Henry, you know, you have more founders. So like it's cheaper, like in that sense, so you might not have to pay loads of stuff, but you might need to scale quickly. Like you might need to get people into, like you have to deliver quicker. But I guess in, in a sense, do you have like very defined roles with everyone in your in your street food business, or is everyone kind of just pitching in? Uh, yeah, no, we we have roles to an extent, but with the pizza making, we will all be pizza makers as well as our side roles as designers and did things. Yeah, mm. how do That's you make good. decisions with with four people? Has someone got the overall say, or no, not quite? We haven't really it's had any or either no huh? well you, you know what happens if two vote for one thing and two vote for the other uh we haven't actually ever got to that stage yet so it will happen trust me i yeah. you know, my business with another person and like really good friends and you know it should have worked out um but you know even just having two people you know kind of making decisions got really difficult um so you want to try and find a fifth person yeah. Yeah. Fighting vote. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Nice. Um, so I, obviously you start when did you start Oh My Dog Joel? Was that like five years ago? Um so I first started Top Dogs, which was the kind of the, the kind of company I had before Oh My Dog, which was with my friend Nikki, who was like the co-founder. And that was in 2013. Okay. Um, we spent like a year just kind of like testing recipes and you know like doing friends parties and stuff like that that never really took off um oh my dog was may 2014 i think so okay. yeah so six, six years six, six and did you uh this is one of henry's questions like did you mm. think it would become a career for you or was it kind of just one of the other things that you were doing yeah, I'd say like, yeah, a hundred percent like a career. Um, you know, I made the decision that I wanted to do something with food. I thought I had a really good idea. I started with a goal of, you know, trying to basically make hot dogs as popular as burgers. Uh, you know, I wanted to have a chain of uh, hot dog restaurants and a fleet of food trucks. And you know, that having that very clear vision has really helped. Um, I know there are some people that kind of. You know, they, they might do it as like a bit of a hobby or a sideline, but I mean, there's very few people that are successful that can continue to do it with a day job because it, it just takes over your life. I mean, everyone tells you when you first start out, that oh, it's going to take over your life, it's going to take over your life. And at the time I was like, well, you know, I'm sure I can manage, but it does like, there's no way around it. It will yeah. like, if you're going to be successful in, in street food, like at some point you're, you're probably going to have to drop the day job uh i reckon yeah but there are some people that manage to do it but they're normally in partnerships where maybe one of them works uh has a day job and then the other one just works on it full time so you know there are there are ways around it 
yeah. So, yeah. I, I guess that's why a lot of people start doing kind of weekend markets, like testing the waters, and mm. then it's slowly kind of getting to the point where it's like, right, I've got to throw it all in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a good way to test the water. Or like go and work for other traders as well and see what it's yeah. about. But I mean, yeah. I remember when we first started Cook Dogs, you know, our, our like the, the, the research we did was basically go to one food market where there was a, a hot dog guy selling hot dogs. And we pretty went for like the busiest hour. And then we did like the calculation of, right, well, he sold like, I don't know, like 30 hot dogs in half an hour. The market's open for like six hours. So we timed that by that. Oh, we'll only have to work three days a week. But in actual fact, like we turned up at the busiest hour. The rest of the time was probably dead. And, you know, you need to kind of work out, you know, realistically, what do we need to be bringing in to actually make it viable? And I think I didn't actually realize really what needed to be done you know to run a successful street food business for like the first couple of years you know the first two years for me i was just sort of running around saying yes to everything and earning hardly any money at all uh, that, was, you know, that was the kind of the formative years and then i think after a while it kind of you get into your groove and you work out what works and what doesn't but yeah. you can't have to go through that kind of early stage and some people you know it might only be a couple of months for me it was longer but um yeah it, it, it took you a while to find your niche i guess right mm. and, yeah and like with such with such a kind of well-known product like a hot dog mm. it's the same for pizza right like to stand out as as an item of quality and figure mm. out like where where you're meant to be that might just take a bit longer and it's but it seems like henry you've been like doing that research for a while as part of like the society mm. and and the tours and how all, yeah. all the founders can cook pizza. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. We're not trying to be like an authentic Italian sort of brand. We're going for very creative, wacky, different sort of pizzas that most people are doing. Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah like we were talking about earlier, like you can, I think most people can get a pretty de decent Neapolitan style pizza, in mo at least in London, like quite easily now. Like, even mm. from pubs and places like that. So to stand out against that, you really have to have like that USP and you and you create you find what that is through experience, mm. through doing markets where you sell two pizzas and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. It's about working out where your you know, what your customer base actually is and, and where you think it'll work. Like for yeah. it's easy to think, you know, everyone loves pizza, so they're just gonna want to eat it all the time. Um it's not necessarily always the case. I mean, I used to think our oh, hot dogs are going to be so great. People are going to want to eat them for lunch, dinner. You know, people in offices will want to eat them. But, we, you know, once we actually got out there and traded, we realized, well, actually, maybe people don't really want hot dogs for lunch when they work in an office, you know, as much as some of the other options. Yeah. So, you know, you've got to kind of find your niche. And, and you know, starting by doing deliveries is a great shout, really, because, um, you know, it's an obvious go to. Thing people get pizza deliveries already. You're not reinventing the wheel. So, um, yeah, I think so what, right. Henry, were you planning to start with doing deliveries, or were you kind of forced well, no, to doing deliveries? Yeah, the deliveries is kind of it's only a thing to make ends meet at the moment because of COVID and all. Like we never really thought we'd get into the delivery market at all, and it's just happened because we can't do anything else right now. Yeah. Ne you know necessity is the mother of all invention you know yeah um, and and you find out things that you might not have discovered otherwise like if if for this maybe you're you're doing the, the groundwork for a delivery app now instead of in two years time that's quite that's quite interesting maybe that will pay off at some point down the line um yeah. do you, henry do you have an idea for like when things start going back to normal like what kind of places and markets in london that you'd like to start trading at do you have a well, rough idea of what you do one of the questions for joel is that we, we've been recommended a few places like bermondsey beer mile is probably a place where we want to start doing pop-ups mm -hmm. just before it started we were at the belleville brewery in wandsworth and okay. had a very successful day there mm -hmm. so we're going to go in with the pubs really and the breweries to kick things off when this when that's allowed yeah that makes sense i mean 
you, you're probably kind of similar to ours in a way that, you know, it's pizza and beer, you know, it goes hand yeah. in hand, hot dogs and beer, burger and beer. So breweries are a great shout and they'd probably be, I mean, do you guys use like wood-fired ovens and stuff or what's your... We have little portable ovens that mm -hmm. reach the same temperatures and create the oh, same... Okay. So a bit like a rock box kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rock box, but in a different company. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. So could you feasibly use that in just any old pub kitchen? Or mm, It's outside currently, mm -hmm. which is a problem we've run into a couple of times. Yeah. So the breweries are great because generally most of them have like outside space. So yeah. Yeah, perfect. Pubs are quite difficult for pizza traders just because, you know, if you cook, like if you're doing wood fire pizza, if you, if you have to cook outside, not every pub's going to have space to do that. And not every pub's going to have like pizza ovens. So like there are definitely like a load of pubs that we worked with um, at the start, but I, I, a lot of them probably wouldn't be suitable for pizza. But the thing I would say is, you know, get in touch with the companies, like the independent companies that own various different pubs. You know, people like uh, Antic, people like Names. You know, these guys own like 20, 30 pubs in London. And, you know, if you can get in touch with the right person and just say, look, this is what we do. Yeah. Uh, you know, which of your pubs would be suitable for a, a pizza setup? Then that would be a good start. Solid. Yeah, uh, and a lot, a lot of them are closed right now. So Ooh. you know, and there are a lot of traders who are kind of pivoted to renting out a pub kitchen space for quite a good rate, and and using that as a base of operations. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And but yeah, I think mean, the breweries are a, a good shout though. Or well, anywhere with a bit of outside space, that would probably be the main challenge. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I'd say don't like don't like overlook the delivery aspect of it because like I expect you know with the right market in and you know in the right area, you probably do more on a Friday night in delivery than you would in you know sort of like one of the lesser breweries, you know on a on a Saturday. So mm -hmm. you, know, you can do both hand in hand, and I think that you know it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, another um, benefit of having four people, I guess. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You yeah, maybe you could do a pub and delivery at the same time, you know. Yeah. Well, exactly. Um, do delivery from the pub as well. Perfect. Yeah, true. I, I, I guess that kind of um, goes on quite nicely to, like, the classic question of, like, vans versus gazebos. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, this is one of the questions Henry asked. I imagine you've been using a gazebo for the kind of events and deliveries that you've been doing. Is that right? Yeah, we don't have a great record with food trucks. <laughs> Basically, I've, I've tried to buy two and both of them are pretty clapped out and never really got on the road properly. Um, but no, we mainly use gazebos because it's like it's a cheaper route to entry. You know, you can sort yourself out a gazebo set up for like a few grand. Whereas, you know, like a van, you're looking at like 20, 30, 40 grand upwards. Um, I guess the benefits of a gazebo is it's is cheaper. Um, customers can see what's going on. It's a lot more open. It's a lot more inviting for customers. They're more likely to come over and have a little nosy, at which point you can start telling them about why your pizza is so great. Uh, with fans, because, you know, often the hatch is a lot higher. Um, you know, customers can feel a little bit intimidated to come up and, and just have a look if they're not sure. So you often find that gazebos actually sell more. Um, or traders in gazebos. Um, also, gazebos are a lot more flexible as well. You know, I mean, we've got like we've got various different gazebos in various different sizes, so we can have all sorts of different con uh, configurations. So, if we're doing something like I know in someone's back garden, and there's only two meters. I've got two meter gazebo. Uh, if they've got, if we're doing a festival and we need six by six, you know, we can put together a, a three by three, a three by three, and a six by three, and create one giant gazebo. So you get a lot of flexibility with gazebos. Um, the downside is very labor intensive. You've got to set it up, you've got to pack it down, you got to cram it into a van. Everyone always buys a van, it's way too small to start off with. I actually bought an estate, a Volkswagen estate, thinking that that would be um, big enough. But yeah, I mean, just buy a big van. Up yeah. No waste time with a small van, and then get a slightly bigger one. And it's currently got a Peugeot partner. So, okay. Who's in the small bracket? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. once you start doing gazebo stuff, you want something big because you don't want to like get a job or, or you're trying to do two jobs in one day or you've got a festival. 
and you can't fit everything in, you know, it's just much easier. Biggest van possible, get everything in there. And then, you know, you can leave it in there as well if you want to, you know, if you want to make life easier for yourself. But getting onto food trucks, um, it's a lot more convenient. You know, you literally turn up, like, get your food out, start cooking. Or, well, clean down, get your food out, start cooking. Um, and then when you finish, you literally just wipe the surface down, put the stuff in the fridge and drive off. So, you know, you've got to weigh up the kind of the labour versus the convenience. Um, yeah. But again, with food trucks, you know, a lot of people buy vintage food trucks that break down a lot. Yeah. You've got I've seen that a lot as well. Yeah, and then you've also got uh, things like the, you know, the ULEZ and yeah. other uh, things. So, I yeah. think it's also about like where you want to, where you want to go like long term mm -hmm. i guess like it it's uh if you if you use a food van as a step towards something else then like there might be a good investment for you mm -hmm. um but like, i was thinking of like rice guys who are on our markets you know had four vans but that's been a stepping stone for them to get permanent places um mm -hmm. so um for, for some people it's like i want to do street food forever so I'm going to get a van, you know, or a trailer or whatever. Um, it's uh, it's about weighing it up. And I guess with four people, I don't know at what point you might all be on the on the uh, gazebo or van together. I guess it's it's just a it's a big investment. Mm. I feel like the ideal would be to do both if you can, because um, yeah. it just gives you that extra flexibility. Because there are some people that you know prefer street food vans people that are like event organizers there are certain places where you'll be able, only be able to do a gazebo certain places you'll only be able to do a van so you know the ideal will probably be working towards having both but yeah it all depends on your circumstances if you're trying to just kind of dip your toe in the water maybe starting out in a gazebo might be better just because it's not such a big investment yeah mm -hmm. cool nice one and then i guess like this is our last question that you sent to us today henry was about um like your experiences joel of curb markets and how it helped you kind of get to where you are today if at all oh yeah no it definitely did um yeah i mean i'd say like being a curb trader opened like loads of doors for us and still you know continues to now um actually trading at the markets was great experience for us even though you know we'd already traded for a couple of years before we, or at least a year, I think, before we joined Curb, um, you know, just getting in there, you know, trading with all these other traders uh, with various different kind of levels of experience um, and just, you know, the, the community and, yeah, just kind of learning things from each other. You know, everyone's really welcoming, generally really helpful. You borrow things from each other, chat about equipment, look at what processes other people are doing. Uh, you know, look at what other people are doing that works, what other people are doing that doesn't work. Um, yeah, it's been invaluable, you know, and it got us into uh, Camden Market as well, which is which is great. It's got us into some amazing um, event, private events as well. Got us cooking hot dogs inside the the uh, Royal Academy of Arts. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a crazy place. Good, good masher. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, it's been. Um, it's definitely been worthwhile. I'd say it was like one of the kind of one of the key kind of uh, things that we did that, that helped us kind of yeah. grow and, and be successful. So yeah, I'd and it's it. one of the, what that community is like. One of the things I've missed the most about what's happening right now and not being able to meet people and talk to people and trade ideas and introduce people and be like, I know this guy. And obviously, using Slack and online, you can kind of do aspects of that. But um, mm. Yeah. Uh, Henry, do you have any other questions for Joel? That has ticked off my five questions, I believe. <laughs> Great. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I know what you were saying, though, Jack, about the, uh, the markets. I mean, that's one thing I've really missed these last few years, you know, not being as involved in markets is, um, you know, just missing the, missing the people in the community and the lunches as well. Yeah. Well, you never know when when start, things start going back to normal. I think people are going to be eating in very different ways, and mm -hmm. uh, maybe I think eating is just going to be a like a ce celebratory act, you know. And mm -hmm. I don't think many things shout celebration to me more than hot dogs or pizza. So <laughs> who knows? Who knows what happened? Thank you so much for joining us today, Joel. Yeah, and, no worries. Uh, Thanks for inviting me on. Yeah, great advice as ever. 
Thank you so much. Cheers. And uh, I'll, I'll talk to you soon. So yeah, Henry, thanks for joining us today. Was that helpful? Yes. Yeah. Cheers for getting Joe along. Yeah, he's he is like a fountain of information. Um, so mm. yeah, it's been really obviously like we've kind of known each other and talked to each other ever since he came to the workshop. But um, yeah. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing like what you're doing next. And we'll definitely come and check in with you um, soon and hopefully try some pizza. For sure, for sure. Yeah. So are, are you serving pizza this weekend as well? Uh, yeah, I've got tonight. It's Tuesday to Saturday service. So oh, it's a bank holiday yeah. this weekend as well. So you might want to do Sunday. Maybe, maybe I'll do, yeah. Or maybe, maybe you can have a day off or something. Who knows? Yeah, the two-day uh, break is quite nice, to be honest. Yeah, my, Monday's the good old like chef's day off. So, um, yeah. yeah, I'll see you soon. And thank you so much for joining today. And I can't wait to try some pizza soon. Beautiful. Thank you, Jack. Okay, see you soon. So, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed that. Thanks for staying with us and watching. Um, as ever, you can support all of our traders via our Keep the Wheels Turning campaign here, curbfood.store. Um, we have another show this Thursday. Um, where all of this week we're focusing kind of on delivery and all of our traders who pivoted, swiveled to doing different types of deliveries. So we're going to be talking to different traders about that and also doing a lockdown lunch with a truffle kit winner. Um, as we said earlier, if you want the, the chance to win a truffle kit, uh, you can enter here um, just by subscribing to our YouTube channel and following Curb and Truffle on Instagram. So I'll see you on Thursday. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.